Welcome to The Reason Roundtable, your weekly podcast from the magazine that loves freedom every bit as much as Flacco the Eurasian Eagle Owl. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Hi, everyone. Howdy. Happy. I uh, believe it's pronounced Flacco. That's Matt. Fla- I want Flacco. I mean, Flaco would also be kind of cool if it was named after, uh, you know, former uh, Arizona Senator of uh, uh, Jeff. Flake. Happy whatever the heck right? that was there Monday. Should be, you should you, there should be a Jeff Flake lookalike Eurasian eagle owl prowling the mean streets of Central Park. I think we can all agree on that at the outset of this podcast. OK, um, start and strong. Uh, sorry, <laughs> start and strong. Um, yeah, what yeah I think maybe I think we're done here was how we can't even uh, stretch our arms out on the porch in the morning without inadvertently punching some politician who wants to crack down on TikTok right in the face. On Fox News this Sunday, it was Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Mark Warner. How long has he been there, Nick? (laughs) Wasn't Mark Warner? Well, he's one of the original Warner Brothers, right? He's one of the original Warner Brothers. So I... You know, 120 years, something like that. Uh, he announced a broad bipartisan bill, BBB, B cubed, to give the federal government leeway to ban Chinese technology, including the popular video sharing service. You have 100 million Americans on TikTok for 90 minutes every day, the Virginia Democrats said. They are taking data from Americans, not keeping it safe. But what worries me more with TikTok is that this can be a propaganda tool. If by propaganda, Mark Warner means spastic 12 second dance lip syncing routines then yes i have witnessed this evil in my own house the house uh, foreign affairs committee last week fast-tracked a similar bill that would give the executive branch authority under the international emergency economic powers act that sounds great to ban tiktok if the administration determines the company has knowingly transferred user data to, to any foreign person i said user data that's fine Take her. Uh, uh, yeah. it's like washington. i hate those people in washington <laughs> yeah <laughs> my, oh my, my long mad day. maybe we should write a book together no we, seem to be, we should uh, not collaborating uh, quite a bit right now uh anyways yeah if you're under the influence uh if they share the uh data data with uh any uh, uh person working for or under the influence of the red chinese government then they could be banned that just scratches the surface of proposed governmental remedies including outright legislative bans suggested by the likes of surprise Je- senator josh Hawley. uh tiktok is prohibited already on government work phones in about half the country plus many state university networks Democratic Senator Michael Bennett is pushing Apple and Google to just remove TikTok from their app stores. That'll work. Uh, But it's not just concern about commies. There's widespread societal and social scientific anxiety popularized by the likes of Jonathan Haidt, no stranger to your earlobes, that the uh, sharp uptick in teen mental health issues over the past decade or so, particularly among the girls, is attributable to smartphones and social networks. Handing TikTok to a teenage girl, the feeling goes, is like asking them to play Russian roulette, or do I mean red Chinese roulette, Catherine? No. Um, no. Bravo. Yeah. All right. That's just, give, give me a little extra time to prepare in the morning. It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> Catherine, uh, I want to get into the uh, teen anxiety stuff a little bit later, but I think that you might have burst a blood vessel this morning oh. um, uh, reading some of the quotes from various politicians about this. Do you want to share the crazy? With did the you class? spill your coffee on your editor I, trousers? I did not do that. In fact, I was in the, kind of the opposite situation. Um, for those who are close listeners to this podcast, you will recall that I busted up my knee. So as a result, I've been riding a fucking exercise bike every morning like a douchebag. Oh, that's And great. so I was on the bike just pedaling away full of resentment. And when I cracked open this <laughs> Wired article about a potential TikTok ban. And it is a good article full of bad things. It is just banger after banger. What does that mean? Of just terrible, terrible quotes from idiots, nicely arranged for my information. And this one was the one that broke me. It was somewhere around mile four. Can we just <laughs> admit that the Chinese Communist Party is an adversary and Silicon Valley is not an actual adversary, says Senator Kevin Kramer of North Dakota, a Republican. These are similar issues, but they're not the exact same issues. The Chinese Communist Party is an adversary. Silicon Valley is an unruly child. Wow. Screw 
Can, you, uh, Kevin Kramer what? of North Dakota sounds like an AI generator. It doesn't sound like a real mm-hmm. senator. I you agree. Figure, right? Check like, that. did anybody check that? And it, it is. Uh, <laughs> Kevin yeah. Kramer. I mean, the, the very notion, first of all, that we would talk about the powerhouse of like innovation and cool stuff in this country as unruly children. The fact that we would talk about any American th- that a, a senator would talk about any American citizens as unruly children is just absolutely shocking. And then, you know, the Wait, fact you're that you're surprised in- by that. That seems like the yeah. least surprising thing I can imagine about a, a, a sitting it's, elected official with a lot of power over I know people's they lives. I believe that. I know they believe that. But it's really a kind of say the quiet part loud scenario to me. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so as you say, there's kind of these dual justifications for why we got to make the TikTok go away forever. And one is the teen girls are sad. And we'll talk about that more. And then the other is China. Um, the China thing is largely hypothetical, which I think is interesting. Like all of the discussions of this are not. We have a smoking gun of the ways in which the Chinese government is using TikTok either to gather data about Americans or to like psyop mood manipulate our teens with the videos, which is absolutely a serious thesis that is being run uh, around on Capitol Hill right now. You can't ban a product that millions of people use on a hypothetical, especially because this narrow ban won't even solve the problem. There is there's still plenty of opportunities for American companies to sell, share, share conclusions from data of the same type with other nations, including China. And we shouldn't ban that either. Or, or for China to just do it on their own, like they don't need a dedicated feed going directly into, you know, Chinese government right. computers. And if, like all of this stuff is available on every social if media. If you do though. have national security concerns there are also that that were serious and well substantiated, there would still be many ways to minimize those risks without just flatly banning a product that millions of people use and love. You know, the uh, essential read on this, the the pre bottle to the current mania is the uh, recent reason article co authored by Milton Mueller. Uh, who's been writing for Internet Freedom going back to the early 80s at Reason. But um, he's got a great piece recently at Reason uh, with a co-author whose name is escaping me, I, and I apologize for that, but runs through all of the arguments why this is a classic Internet hysteria um, and should not be taken seriously, and that the main policy prescription, which is Okay, let's ban it. So China is bad partly because of the Great Firewall of China, which we've been hearing about for decades now, where they ban free access to their citizens on internet stuff. We're going to fix them by doing something amazingly similar. It's like, great. You know, why don't we, why don't, you know, once Russia starts drafting people, why don't we start instituting a draft? Uh, maybe, you know, you got to fight fire with fire. The co author uh, is, by the way, uh, Georgia Tech's Karim Farhat. Thank you. Uh, Nick, that sounded dangerously close to a Washington Post editorial, uh, at least a pitch yeah. there. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, get, I, I have uh, uh, ironic quotes about <laughs> it all. But no, uh, it's 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 amazing how like all you have to do to resurrect the shittiest arguments of the Cold War is sprinkle, you know, some kind of like Internet fairy dust on it or something like that or social media. Now, the Internet is too old, um, but um, you know, once once we're talking about social media, uh, the, my favorite uh, argument that is starting to emanate from this with the stink of, you know, like weak old socks on top of a laundry hamper is the idea that, you know, in China, TikTok exclusively is used to teach like, you know, uh, third, you know, eighth year calculus to, uh, you know, uh, uh, babies in utero in China. But here all we're doing is milk crate challenges and silly dances. So the real threat to this is that it's distracting children from learning higher level math so we can compete with China. I should uh, mention how my uh, teen now, uh, teen girl, 14, uh, has evolved in her TikTok usage. It used to be the aforementioned uh, spastic dancing and lip singing, and there's probably still some of that. But mostly now, she and her cohort are using it to share clips of culture that they enjoy. Um, and for her, that is uh, two main sources these days, uh, which probably tells you something about my parenting, if nothing else. Uh, one is uh, uh, videos from Breaking Bad, 
or like uh, compilation videos from Breaking Bad. And the other is uh, South Park. She's absolutely hysterically pro South Park and just is sending me TikTok clips of editing South Park day after day. Peter, uh, I want you to react to your fellow Floridian uh, Senator uh, Marco Rubio said the following about TikTok. It's kind of a long quote, but just bear with me here. If you're certain- And and imagine him dancing to it, doing a TikTok dance. Oh my God, yeah. Just the arm action would be like better than Michael Stipe. He has to stand on a table. Yeah, he has to stand on a table so we can see his whole body. But That's me in the quote. If you're certainly willing to fly a balloon over your continental airspace and have people see it with a naked eye, what would make you not weaponize data? To have virtually all of the data on over 50 million American devices accessed daily by the Communist Party of China will pose an indescribable risk to America's national security, to our economy, to our competitiveness. Just think about the advantage China would have uh, information on us, their government would have information on us, that no government in the history of the world has ever had on the citizens of another country. There's nothing to compare it to. Uh, Peter, is he right or just totally right? I think a lot of this is really hyperbolic. At the same time, I'm not sure I totally agree with Catherine that the concerns about Chinese government use of data and interaction with um, American media companies and sort of American entertainment is totally hypothetical because we, in fact, do know how China interacts with American media and entertainment companies um, because there are a, there there are a lot of uh, American companies that do business with China, um, the NBA and, and video game companies in Hollywood in particular. And what China ends up doing is it prohibits criticism of an authoritarian regime, um, even light, indirect and implied criticism. Uh, it makes it makes American uh, corporations toe the line. It makes American movie stars issue completely ridiculous apologies for having accidentally said like the wrong three word phrase in the midst of an answer. Um, right. And it, it implicitly it doesn't make that's them. true. Oh, you're right. It doesn't yeah, make them. Not. It's What's simply that? it's simply it simply cre- it creates that's a an domestic environment. You're right. it's, it's implicit. But what it does is it creates an environment where if they want to do business in China, they've they feel like they have to do this, right? And so American uh, movie companies are editing movies uh, for the Chinese market, right? They sometimes get totally different scenes. Um, uh, villains are removed because of the Chinese market, right? Because uh, in, in order not to offend uh, China. And in some ways, this is small ball stuff. And this, is, I think, is actually sort of where I'm like less concerned about this is even is like, in some ways, like this is objectionable and I don't like it. And in other ways... I guess I'm not that I don't feel like it's a giant national security threat that I don't know, a a former wrestler who's now a movie star has to issue an awkward apology for some of this stuff. I'm not like that bothered by all of this personally. I don't feel like it's that big a deal. At the same time, I don't think it's nothing. And I think that like as libertarians who are concerned about government power. We should be concerned about the biggest, most oppressive totalitarian regime on the planet and the ways that they exercise power, not only over their own citizens, but the ways that they will sort of use soft power to uh, to to do. You don't know what. And this is right. To do what? With Again, TikTok. and this is and this is what? and this is yeah, and, that's, and so I mean that's I a, I agree with you, Peter. This is the biggest flaw in this argument is everyone's like, well, China will have a lot of data and they will do. And then that's like they'll that's it. There's a big blank after that. And it's not obvious what they're going to do with all of our TikTok videos, except suppress the ones that are like, let me tell you why China is a very bad authoritarian totalitarian government. And in some ways, that's bad. But you know what? There's always Facebook and there's always Twitter and there's always, you know, uh, there's always Substack if you want to like share your anti-China, uh, like China is very bad, dis- you know, destroying like the, the, the like the freedom for, you know, a billion people uh, arguments and like are we that worse off because you can't say that on TikTok and that, and TikTok is very popular? I don't know. I I in some ways I also just but don't can. deeply don't care because five or ten years from now no one will be on TikTok. No, that's not true. That's uh, that's what that is also hyper uh, hyperbole. At the same time, I just I view social media as like not a static arrangement, and the fact that TikTok is the uh, the the social media site of the moment and the one that teens are currently obsessed with, like. The thing that we know from the last 20 years of social media is that 10 years from now, TikTok will no longer be the hot, cool thing. And to try to and to treat it as this giant 
legitimate threat, even if you think there are legitimate concerns with like Chinese communists, authoritarian governments, you know, who like, in fact, do demand a, a certain amount of um, a, a certain amount of uh, uh, sort of uh, control of, from Chinese owned companies, right? Like Chinese owned companies operate genuinely differently than American companies do uh, with regards to the ways that they, they interact with their government. At the same time, it's like 10 years from now. Ten years from now, everybody's going to be in the metaverse, how many, right? How You're many, arguing Peter, now Peter, with let's yourself let other people again. Argue with yeah. you, uh, besides yourself. Yeah. I mean, on. if if I may, uh, just one one really important factor to this specific debate is that the versions of TikTok that are available outside of China do not censor, as far as far as you know is known, do not censor content. And this is part of the Mueller article uh, where he really talks about how you know criticism of the Chinese government. Uh, and, you know, uh, defenses of Falun Gong and, and other things that are verboten to talk about in China is available there. Peter, I agree that there is something really disturbing about the way the uh, U.S. entertainment industry is kowtowing to China in all sorts of obvious ways and less obvious ways. And that should be a absolute, uh, you know, topic of conversation. But again, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is a bipartisan bipartisan consensus brewing in the US of the government they're not going to restrict China you know they're going to restrict Americans ability to do what they want and to say what they want and it has to be called out as a you know a kind of internet fueled social media enabled hysteria that should stop and we should be having those arguments i mean it's you know it's still about uh the uh the US entertainment industry the way the nba responded uh, to mild criticisms of China, the way that Blizzard Entertainment and other, uh, you know, other actors have done, we should be having a robust screaming match about that in America, uh, because that's fucked up, and that's something we can control as consumers, or we can affect as consumers. Uh, Catherine, let's go to the John Height argument about this: Are TikTok social media apps, smartphones? The whole lot like handing a loaded gun to adolescent girls. And if so, have you already handed that gun to yours because guns are awesome? Uh, guns are awesome. And I'm looking forward to my newly 12 year old daughter going to uh, learning to shoot rifles camp this summer, uh, which is <laughs> which is it's three weeks. It's three weeks in the woods. That's the Lyle and Eric Menendez. No, shooting it's camp. like a it's like a 1920s <laughs> like uh, 1920s feminism camp. So it's like all girls. But it's like we gals got to dress for dinner and learn to shoot guns. It's going to be great. Anyway. Um, that's what I have given her. I have not yet given her TikTok because I think that a big part of this equation, I'm old enough to remember when libertarians and conservatives would say stuff about parental responsibility. I don't know what happened to that. That's fully gone. Well, it's, well we still have parental heard... responsibility. It's just that the senators think that Americans are the children and they're the parents. Right. They're the, the unruly quote. children. That's yes. a good point. That's an excellent point. Parental responsibility is now solely in the hands of a made up senator from a Dakota. But um, the, you know, I do think that's West uh, Dakota. I do think that's a, a huge part of this equation is like uh, my kid's not on TikTok yet. She will be because it's pretty fun. I love TikTok. I spend I am part of the Americans that spend many, many minutes a day on TikTok. Um, it's delightful. Uh, I am annoyed at TikTok for promoting uh, for the kind of censorship it actually does do, which is, um, you know, obscenity and kind of, um, you know, that, that type of content, because it means that all the people use dumb euphemisms for everything they're still talking about these topics but they just use like um only pans is like what they say instead of only fans and it's like i don't think that's working i think this has just made everyone sound stupid so <laughs> i'm I, there is some censorship sure on tiktok um but as far as we can tell in american tiktok as uh, as noted it is not it is not in the service of the the red chinese um so wait so it's I like the big lebowski when you watch it on television and and John yes. Goodman is yelling, this is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps, except that's yes. not and what he's edit, saying. Exactly. The people edit their captions, so they still verbally say the words, but the captions don't have it on the theory that maybe the algorithm is searching the captions. It's dumb. Anyway, this does not answer your question. Your question is, what about the sad teen girls? 
there's clearly something real going on. And I am sympathetic to what seems to be a large cohort of like men in their 50s who are really, really worried about this. Um, I am more. <laughs> be nice. You hey, be nice. You know, I yeah. am They're called worried parents. about it too. Catherine. But I think it is, you know, my bias here is that it is almost always a mistake to select for a monocausal technological explanation for a social phenomenon. That's it. Well, that's well put. Well and put. this uh, right. is that right now. That's where Let's, the discourse uh, is. Uh, can I just point Go out, uh, and I realize this has nothing to do with what we're talking about, <laughs> but when you were talking about censorship <laughs> on TikTok- What's wrong with this pod today? <laughs> you know, well- what you know google the filthiest sex yeah, acts you can you. imagine no on twitter oh, on, on twitter. twitter and there is there is hardcore pornography available on twitter and all of the discussions of twitter and censorship and content moderation like i've never heard anybody just point out you know there is hardcore porn there's a twitter. lot of hardcore porn and on I'm, the internet like there's plenty really? of porn no 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 but what not not on not on facebook not on uh uh Instagram, not on Twitter. You you would expect not on Twitter, but it's there. And it's how would you of define magnets. hardcore versus no. other types? Uh, Google hardcore no, porn, no. Peter. Peter, Google. Imagine something nope, and nope. enter it into Twitter, and you will uh, you'll get a mouthful. Nope, no lemon. Maybe an earful. Uh, all right. Uh, last week, what our is own, that? Uh, P- Did you just make our that own up? Peter Suderman, please wrote a what great a lemon piece. party. Don't. Just, just please. Matt Welch was, he kind of hosted the original one, if I'm remembering correctly. <laughs> don't, don't do it. If you do it while we're doing this, this uh, podcast, it's going to be bad. This is listener and participant alike. Uh, let's pivot to Peter Suderman. Uh, not about lemon parties yet, but uh, about the great piece he wrote last week uh, that I want to talk about. The headline and subhead are as follows. Decades of subsidies have made the essentials of middle class life increasingly difficult to afford. The basics of middle class life are too expensive, but more subsidies won't help. Peter, please explain to the class how government interventions to make things affordable have made things more expensive. Paradoxically, yeah, so there's been this, uh, and this fascinating sense- political movement. Yeah. Over the the past couple of years, where the where like it's mostly been on the center left, and it has come, I think, in in large part as a reaction to the kind of the conflagrations and the distractions of the Trump era, right? Like since 2015, American politics has had a lot going on, and it's been kind of crazy. Some of it's been serious, some of it's been very silly, but I'll, something has gotten lost in in our, our political discourse, and that has been what we used to call kitchen table issues, which is like basic cost of living issues. And those have come back to the fore, in part because people are just experiencing them generally, and in part because of inflation, and in part because uh, some of the, the the essentials of middle class life, or at least what people feel like are the essentials of middle class life, people have started to realize, and in particular, center left pundits have started to realize, oh my God, they're really, really expensive. And the three things that I focus on in this post are healthcare, education, particularly higher education, uh, and housing. And so we have this movement now on the center left called the that that is sort of loosely uh, uh, coalescing around the term the abundance agenda. And their argument is, well, you know, we've we've uh, it's like it's mo- it's focused, I think, more on housing than on anything else. And they have like a a, a totally non insane argument, which is one reason that housing is so expensive is we've made it really hard to build things. And what we need to do is to let builders build things that will put more supply on the market, and that will help us uh, ease prices. At the same time, healthcare and higher education have kind of been talked about within this, this constellation of issues of things that are really, really expensive. But there's been a lot less attention, I think, paid to the fact that those two, uh, that those two um, sectors of the economy have for the last 40 or 50 years just been incredibly subsidized. Starting in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, we have just pumped billions and billions, tens, hundreds, trillions of dollars uh, into, into subsidies for these things. And what has that done? Well, in higher education, it's really very clear what uh, what trillions of dollars worth or over a trillion dollars worth of, of loans has done. It's made it in some ways 
uh, it's it's provided money for people to to pay for college tuition. But then the universities are just like, well, that also makes it easy for us to spend more money on administrators and swimming pools and also just to jack up tuition because we can, because we know that you have the money because buyers have more money because they are being given it through subsidies. That makes it more expensive inherently. And so then you have uh, then you have uh, this um, this sort of trajectory where costs go up. And subsidies go up in tandem, and and the underlying thing is actually becoming much more expensive. And the same thing is true in healthcare. I mean, the, the United States government, in some ways, can be thought of as a kind of a health insurance company that also does defense and some other stuff. And like we spend so much money, so much public money on healthcare every single year, and people are like, why does healthcare cost so much? It's really, really expensive. Maybe, maybe what we need to do is add some more subsidies to make it less expensive. And all that does is at best, it temporarily shields people from prices, right? Like it, it it can make those prices invisible to people, but making prices invisible to people means that the market is no longer responsible or responsive to price signals. And that drives prices up, that drives costs up. And then we end up in a situation where we are now, which is, hey, everything that is important Education, healthcare, housing is really, really expensive. Ha! Huh. I wonder why that is. And it's it's at least in part because we've spent the last four or five or six decades subsidizing the hell out of all of those things. And I think that there has that the abundance agenda center left has not spent enough time recognizing um uh, reckoning with with the effects of those subsidies and certainly democratic politicians who seem very, very keen, even if they're sort of center lefty types, very, very keen to keep those subsidies flowing and keep expanding them. Certainly the the democratic political class has not reckoned with that at all. Catherine, what's your favorite example of uh, subsidies to make things more affordable, not doing that? It's just education. It's just higher education. I mean, that's it's not a like a cute little surprise answer, but it is the most important one, I think, because I don't care about buying a house, but I really care about, you know, education. Um, this weekend, my my guy, venture capitalist Mark Andreessen and recent recent uh, reason interview victim uh, spoke at a conference and he said, we are headed into a world where a flat screen TV that covers your entire wall costs a hundred dollars and a four year degree costs a million dollars. And that's right. <laughs> that's right. And he said this, you know, he said this over and over. He has this whole thing about like fast and slow parts of the economy, which map neatly onto the regulated and the unregulated. But also in our interview, which you can listen to on the Reason Interview podcast with Nick Gillespie, you know, one thing that we talked about is that the, the place where you are allowed to innovate is when it doesn't matter. So when it's something frivolous, you can try something bold and new and awesome. But if things are really important, we can't let the market take care of it. That's kind of like the place that we are. And it's the worst possible place to be. Like, this is why Silicon Valley is unruly children. It's because we we have only given them the frivolous to act on. And it's it's like just very, very frustrating because the more important something is, the more innovation you want in that space. And we've created exactly opposite incentives with these subsidies. But we've had huge innovation in the viral dance routine. Side. Yeah, we have. <laughs> that is true. Uh, Nick. Um, but also in the higher ed market, what I was going to say is I, I generally I like the abundance uh, agenda stuff coming out of the left. I've hung yeah, out with a bunch I should, of people I should who say are that interested too, just that. since I probably no, but sounded you're like right. I was criticizing them. There's no, no, no. They but are in your directionally correct in a lot of ways. In your piece, you point out that you know they are now you know they they haven't fully accounted for or, or you know to some degree they they understand that if you subsidize demand without increasing supply, you just you get higher prices. But you know, and the and the the easy answer is to stop subsidizing demand and allowing supply to grow. What I was going to say though is that there. I think that the market in housing, markets in housing, healthcare, and higher education in particular are very distinct and they follow different uh, kind of imperatives. And part of what's going on in higher education is not simply that a lot of money is being pumped into the system. If you break things down, first off, more and more people are second or third generation going to college and they are demanding a different type of product. And this is more of a, a class-based analysis than anything. If you went to 
a directional state university, you want your kid to go to the flagship state school, and then those their kids want to go to a private school, even if it's not academically as good as you know, like a Big Ten university. Uh, there, that is driving huge increases in in higher education spending. If you look at state school tuition and fees over the past decade, it's been flat. Uh, totally within the reach of almost anybody who qualifies as middle class because of financial aid or because your parents make enough. That's not what people are talking about. And, you know, tuition and fees at many places has been flat or even declining because it is sensitive to demand. But the consumers of higher education are saying, well, I want the climbing wall. I want the lazy river. I want a different type of experience. And you have to factor in like each each of these major uh you know kind of sub economies responds to different things uh you know there's no question that medicare more than anything else is the major engine of price inflation but it's also true when you go to the doctor you are getting a radically different experience than you know now than if you went in 1973 the pharmacopoeia is much more robust the machines, the diagnostics, et cetera. And we need to account for that because uh, in each of these industries, something different is helping to drive the prices up. And sometimes that's stupid consuming on my, uh, you know, from my perspective. I think a lot of people, uh, uh, higher education, which has become ubiquitous, uh, you know, about two thirds of graduating high school seniors go on directly to some form of higher ed. It's become a consumption good, a, a luxury good. And a status good, and I think if people were more educated consumers, uh, you know, to uh, paraphrase Cy Sims uh, of the great uh, off-brand shopping place, uh, a lot of this inflation would be uh, would be undercut. Um, all right, we're going to get to our listener email of the week here in a moment, but first, self-reliance, responsibility, using your head. These are just a few of the values we try to embrace here at the Reason Roundtable. That's why it's so fitting for us to tell you about the Air Medcare Network <clears throat> and how it can take a financial worry right off your plate. The Air Medcare Network is America's largest emergency air ambulance membership network. Their providers operate state-of-the-art helicopters and their specially trained medical personnel provide the highest level of pre-hospital emergency medical care. You see, even with the seemingly robust health insurance policies, such flights can be fantastically expensive. But when you're a member of the Air Medcare Network, you won't see a bill for your flight when flown by a participating provider. That's the kind of financial safety net a self-reliant person should think about having. Membership is amazingly affordable, only $99 per year, just $79 for seniors, Nick. And it covers your entire household. What? But wait, what? You like you like you don't have a membership to the AARP. I got my card like a, a month ago. No, I, I was merely suggesting I couldn't hear you, Matt. Because oh, okay, I'm old. Uh, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Listeners who act right now can get up to an eighty dollars Mastercard or Amazon gift card when they join. Just visit airmedcarenetwork.com forward slash reason. Use the offer code reason and start enjoying peace of mind today. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right, reminder to send your terse queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Brenner Roth, wonderful name, who writes in part, my question is related to journalism quality. As the managing structure of news organizations and incentives have changed, i.e. private equity buying newspapers, subscription-based models becoming more prevalent, how has this affected reporting in our country? Uh, political affiliation of the writer has become a bigger issue, but beyond that, do mainstream writers just not care, don't want to, or cannot do deeper analysis because of competing priorities, or maybe reader attention spans have gotten even shorter and they can get away with it? Seems like more and more journalists are only concerned with Twitter battles. I look at the analysis coming from major news outlets, and it regularly seems to be only surface level or just taking things they hear at face value. Catherine, can you reflect on how, if at all, uh, structural changes in the uh, news biz have changed coverage or if it's the, the audience or what? Yeah, I think that um, I guess I'm just hyping interviews that I have done for reason in the past on this podcast today, because um, one thing that really changed my thinking on this um, or crystallized my thinking on this, I guess, was the interview I did a while back with Jimmy Wales, who founded Wikipedia um, and who has a whole theory of the Internet that is based on um, basically whether it is an ad based model or a subscription based model and how that 
subtly affects the type of content that gets produced and the ways that people experience content online. Um, one thing that's happened in recent years is that we're moving back toward a subscription based model um, that there's you know the sub stackification, the sort of increasing willingness of people to pay for the content they want, in addition to the kind of technological warfare of um, paywalls finally getting good enough that they actually keep people out of the content that they shouldn't see and let people in to get enough of a taste. Um Plus the rise of lots of different types of journalistic content, including podcasting, um, you know, along with newsletters and other types, not just let's put it all on a website or in a you know, dead tree edition. Um, all of that is by way of saying when you are trying to get eyeballs for your ads, it generates different types of content. And I think that a lot of the weariness that people feel with the news is a secondary product of that, that reader attention spans are not necessarily shorter so much as the way that you make money doesn't require readers to have attention spans. Um, one thing that's great about Reason is because we are a nonprofit, we can prioritize stuff besides just the raw numbers of clicks and the raw numbers of eyeballs and the raw numbers of ad revenue, though all those things are important to us. So I think that um, rather than try to explain, you know, everything through the lens of, um, yeah, I think people are people are tempted to this private equity explanation, for instance. I think it's much more about um, the ways that we as journalists adapt ourselves to the broader commercial model that we exist in um, and that the move towards subscription based models will actually be a good thing. Nick, how would you answer this question? Uh, I agree with uh, Catherine that you know the, the the what what is going on is a return or a, a move towards more of a subscription based model, and it's out of the broadcasting era, you know, which was a dominant mode, uh, you know, where advertisers subsidized the cost of newspapers, either you know each edition or a subscription, but on TV and radio you paid nothing, and the price, you know, the what you had to put up with was ads. What we're seeing now increasingly is a return to subscriptions. Um, and it's the small newspapers and, and the chains that are being bought by private equity firms um, that are struggling with this. Because do you really want to, you know, if you want to read the Indianapolis Star or something like that, do you want to, you know, pay a hundred dollar subscription in order to read one article that comes across your feed? Probably not. The New York Times, uh, following on the early and ongoing success of the Wall Street Journal, has finally been able to, you know, turn uh, itself into a giant newsletter that is, you know, that is subscription based. One of the things about that, and this has nothing to do with kind of the quality of journalism or uh, or even the quantity, but it does change it if you are doing effectively ideological service journalism for your subscribers. And this is true of something like you on the fifth column, Matt, or the New York Times, or whatever, like you start playing to your paying customers. I know I had an interesting conversation with Andrew Heaton, who has, you know, a couple of uh, popular podcasts and things like that has, you know, worked at, uh, worked at Reason and, and done a lot of stuff with videos. But he will talk about, you know, he's got like a 3000 core subscriber base. And when he does something that they dislike, you know, they let him know and he's he's not slavishly devoted to them, but it's like, you know, you respond to that in a way uh, that in an advertising model, it's a little bit easier sometimes to to bear the heat of intense disagreement from your paying fan base. Um, you know, these are people with skin in the game. And I worry about that at a place like the New York Times. Um, if it becomes too devoted to servicing what it thinks its readers wants. Um, it's going to become less interesting for a broader population, uh, which again, in the long run, doesn't matter, but it does because you can either like it or not. Uh, and this is a glorious time for great, bizarre, wonderful, in-depth investigative reporting, as well as all kinds of bullshit. Um, but it, it definitely changes the way it works. Uh, I think there's a audience capture uh, is a threat. We saw this in the early days of uh, blogging, which I uh, participated in, or like the secondary days. The first were about tech blogs. And then after 9-11, there was a bunch of current affairs, Instapundit style blogs. War blogs. And war blogs. Thank you, Catherine. I'm here for you. Editor pants. Um, uh, and you saw that with a lot of people, they got captured 
to just fantastical degrees. The I think the best example is uh, Charles Johnson of Little Green Footballs, just to throw, throw us all back. Um, wow. He got warped into some pretty interesting places and then pulled himself back and kind of scrubbed his archives and and whatnot but it's very difficult to and people- is he now is he a member of the reality based community or the unreality based? the last community? time i paid attention to charles who i know uh or i knew uh back in the day was probably about 10 years ago and he was a very uh, pro obama by, uh, by then so i guess the whole pancake so award. you're skirting you're skirting the question you're, yeah is I, that I'm reality not, or unreality i would see know. exactly right um but uh peter let's uh before i blather on too much uh you're a you're a sub stacker uh, how yeah, do you this I mean, I, I think the answer is just that incentives matter. Um, and so I will focus on a, a different um, set of incentives than we have talked about so far. The old ad driven market had particular content incentives in terms of the type of content uh, that newspapers in particular, um, uh, weekly news magazines uh, were interested in running. And so we've had this debate about objective journalism and both sides over the past 20 years, in part as the uh, old ad driven model has collapsed. Um, right. The, the the idea of objective journalism and, you know, sort of, oh, we're just going to tell both sides of the story. Right. And be neutral about it has been sneered at a lot recently. And I think in some cases, uh, some of the critiques are, are totally spot on. Um, but that. That biz that that wasn't just a content model. That was a business model, um, and it was in part a product of the fact that advertisers back in the the old days, and sort of, let's say pre two thousand, the advertisers were the most important market. I mean, in in nineteen eighty five or nineteen ninety five, even if you paid for a newspaper or magazine, the publication often made little or e- money off your subscription. Occasionally, even lost money off your subscription. The idea was just to show usually. Uh, advertisers that you were invested enough to pay for it and they made all of their money basically off of advertising right and so that meant and it was yes. a lot of money i'm going to yep. interject that was 25 percent profit yep. margins there was almost no sector that was as profitable as daily city newspapers between 1960 and and that was true in small markets like cleveland and cincinnati or medium-sized markets let's say like mediums you know like cleveland and cincinnati as well as new york and los angeles it wasn't just you know uh it wasn't just a couple of big national papers which is the market we are increasingly moving towards now right and and so they were responsive to advertiser concerns and Advertisers historically were somewhat antsy about partisan political news and news that appeared to be slanted, right? They all, or I won't say all, but they, they by and large took the Michael Jordan line, you know, Republicans buy shoes too, right? It, it didn't pay to be political in the way that you went about selling shoes or whatever it was, right? That's a little less true today in 2023. I think there are more big corporations that are comfortable with somewhat more sort of politically charged uh, marketing, advertising, uh, salience to their products. Um, but even still, uh, I, I I think that the, the, like the loss of advertisers there has had um, uh, the loss of advertisers as an influence on content has changed the content. Um, right. And the shift uh, from, you know, from an ad supported model where the goal was to have a fat Sunday paper filled with expensive color circulars for your local grocery store and furniture store and electronics. Store. I, I loved the, uh, the circuit city ads when I was a kid, like just poured through them for like the latest, the latest in like receiver and television technology and like moving away from that, the, the loss of circuit city ads has changed what kind of content papers and magazines are willing to run. I think that's not true for a publication like Reason just because our our, our revenue model, right, our, our, is, is very different. But it's certainly true for the New York Times. It's certainly true for the remaining sort of mid-sized market papers. It's certainly true, I think, for, you know, any of the kind of they're, they're, the news weekly business is no longer what it once was, but magazines and, and publications that fill that space. And so there simply has been a shift and it has been a response to incentives. I think that one underappreciated change in the subscription model is that the old subscription model, um, uh, which, yes, was like subsidizing the ad uh, uh, thing more than anything else, but it was an eat your Wheaties model. Um, especially if you're a large institutional place, like I have to subscribe to the Los Angeles Times to know what's going on to get those juicy Circuit City ads. Um, uh, you know, it's my civic duty to subscribe. Well, you know, I have to third subscribe. rate Henry Kissinger op eds that have been turned down by bigger papers. <laughs> uh, yep. Right. 
Uh, no. no, and I have to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal to know what's going on with business. If I'm if I'm working in finance in Wall Street, you just have to subscribe to this, and that still works a little bit for specialized places like the Wall Street Journal, maybe the Economist, but a lot less so probably than before. Um, you know, you just sort of this is part of your civic duty is to do that. Well, that. Uh, subscription model has really, really withered. What has supplanted it is an affinity-based subscription model. I'm going to use my subscriptions as a consumption to express my affection for reason. I mean, we have a webathon every year that certainly brings in more money than it did 12 years ago, um, and uh, and you know, a lot of our readers. And I, I can speak confidently for Catherine and Nick on this. Part of the greatest thing about being an editor of Reason is that you meet people who have these long relationships that are lo- older than many of us are almost uh, uh, the, to the institution and they care about it. And so it's, it's an expression of their affection. And this is very true of uh, of Suderman on Substack. It's very true of other people, too. Um, that's interesting and good. It, there is the. Um, the the problems uh, or the potential threats of audience capture, and then there is you know people always fret about the siloization. But I think one of the great uh, disastrous reactions to the modern age by those legacy institutions is on one hand they looked at these formerly twenty five percent profit margins that they could see were not going to last, and they said, okay, what can we do here? Um, on the business side, they're like, let's cut everything as much as possible and squeeze the last blood out of the stone. And they cut really stupidly. They did uh, on the personnel side, they had buyouts, which just allowed the best people to walk out the door back when that that was still a thing. Um, and they cut coverage in such a way where you didn't, you know, even if the eat your Wheaties people, like there wasn't enough Wheaties here. Like the LA Times sports section is like six pages now instead of this wonderful thing that it used to be. So it's really kind of no use to it. Um, they did that. And then on the uh, now, what Peter was talking about, the sort of the anti both sidesism movement, a lot of increasingly the uh, journalistic uh, personnel establishment um, are treating their institutions as these important places that they need to protect the platform. They're bringing more ideology into the place and kind of policing that ideology, thinking that is the value add here, or at least that's the thing that they that they value the most about it uh, personally. I think that's going to be uh, disastrous because the thing that they had an advantage of over everybody else is that they had deep pockets and they could do and they had a, a history of reporting um, and at least some kind of uh, idea that they would approach things with a certain amount of fairness. And when that goes away, then there's really no there's what are we doing here anymore? It's it's really becomes more of an ideological organ. And a lot of the the things that we've seen over the last few years, the New York Times, especially, but at other institutions, NPR comes to mind, um, uh, the Project Veritas. Uh, Project Veritas, the dancing, uh, all comes from that. Okay, that's enough blather about that. Uh, but thank you for the uh, question. Let's go to a lightning round. I wanted to get to this because it sort of has to do with everything that we uh, have talked about thus far, but really needs to be lightning. Over the weekend, uh, the former and would be future president, Donald J. Trump, released a kind of amazing video uh, saying that in 2024, he wants to build new cities. On currently undeveloped federal land in which there would be flying cars, baby subsidies, and really nice architecture. Catherine, surely you cannot be opposed to flying cars 2024. Yeah, it's, I guess this is Donald Trump's answer to the abundance agenda. Like, I guess that's where we are. Oh, it's fucking great. And I'm (laughs) pro flying car. I'm anti subsidy. So you can see the bind that I am in here because I am sure that. None. Well, first of all, I'm sure that this is what what we see is what there is, right? Like the details of this plan are like maybe one millimeter deeper than this video. Um, but uh, it's it's odd, right? Because on the one hand, what a delight to see a politician be like, hey, maybe we should we should let people try stuff. Maybe we should, um, you know let people build stuff like I love to hear it. But then you get, you know, point point five beautification campaign, get rid of ugly buildings. Right. And that's like, (laughs) no, not that. I want Tucker Carlson to be on that uh, committee for sure. Um, I do recommend to um, Reason Roundtable listeners, if you are not familiar with just like the general CJ Ciramella rage about 
traditionalist conservatives having architecture opinions. Like, go seek that out. I don't actually even know if he's ever done a full length treatment for us and he should. But he tweets about it on the regular. It just kind of creeps in in his general presence. So look for it because. Even though I started out as a little baby um, objectivist, Ayn Rand gal, architecture should not be political. It is not political. It doesn't make any sense to be like, I am a conservative. Therefore, I like exposed beams. Like, please stop. So, Nick, uh, do I hear you volunteering to be Trump's press secretary on the? Oh, uh, I would I, I would vote for Trump if this was his campaign. And especially if he said, like, and I'll give you the land, but no other subsidies. But, yeah, this is fucking great. Are you kidding? Like, and it is, it's peak boomer dementia, too, because what he is basically, you know, channeling is like popular mechanics or boy's life circa 1969. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I like already that's better than anything Joe Biden's talking about. You know, Joe Biden is zipping around in a Corvette. Donald Trump is talking about flying over some bizarre city uh, on the prairie somewhere. And I, it's not even clear. Has Donald Trump ever been to any state other than like New York, New Jersey, and Florida? So he, he has no idea what country he's in. But yeah, more power to it. I love this kind of stuff. And you could see how a libertarian candidate, somebody like Gary Johnson, you know, could have pulled this off with much more verb, verve and uh, knowledge of what it's like to live in a, in, a, in a state that is completely owned by the federal government. You said Gary Johnson and Verve in the same sentence. Peter, uh, do you want to give yeah. us a, a reality yeah, check? Yeah, I just hope the flying cars are EVs that could be subsidized yeah. to create good manufacturing jobs. I, You know, if electric cars are subsidized, flying cars are going to be super subsidized. Um. I uh, think that the best part about of all of this is the idea of deregulating federal lands. It's a thing that people just really don't appreciate much, uh, as much as they should, of how much the federal government owns and controls land, especially in the Mountain West and the West in general, military in particular, but obviously the Bureau of Land Management. And yeah, open open that up. Don't open the libel laws. Open up the, the other land. BLM. Yes, exactly. Um uh, all right, let's get to our end of podcast, what we have all been consuming. Uh, uh, Nick, let's start with you. Uh, so I watched the uh, uh, Chris Rock uh, Netflix special, Outrage, Selective Outrage, sometimes it's called, and uh, it's very good. I actually happened to see him on the tour that this was taken from, uh, playing Radio City Music Hall, where he was workshopping some of this, the the main taping that he's done is from Baltimore. And it even includes a kind of obvious mistake that he made that he corrects in real time. But I highly recommend it. Uh, Chris Rock, this is a, it, it's taken from a longer kind of a set of material. Uh, it's very good. And it opens with a really great defense of free speech where I've seen this being circulated widely. Um, you know, he says anybody that has, uh, anybody who thinks that words hurt has never been punched in the face. <laughs> and it's a pretty good line and it goes from there. It's it's good stuff. Uh it is also the amount of uh kind of ire he spills towards uh Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith, which is extended from what I saw him live in concert, is really good. It's if you're into, you know, if you liked Betty Davis and Joan Crawford feuding, uh this is way, way up there. And on black Twitter, it is uh, you know, it is on fire. Uh, Chris Rock is seen as a black comic that white people like, and they're backing uh, Will and Jada on this. But it's good stuff. Highly recommend it. Uh, the I'll just uh, add that the two clips that I've watched, the Robert Kardashian stuff and then the Will and Jada uh, thing, The my biggest takeaway was, my God, he's he really is turning into Gilbert Gottfried. Like he's just hunched over. His eyes are getting even squintier. He's just yelling all the time like that. Um, uh, Catherine, what have you been consuming? So I've been on a little campaign to watch key episodes in shows that I am apparently never going to get around to so that I can be more culturally literate. And nice. a recommendation from The Reason Roundtable's own Ian Kaiser, our faithful um, audio producer, is uh, in Deep Space Nine. I watched the episode Treachery, Faith, and the Great River, 
which is basically Star Trek Does I Pencil, and it's fantastic. I can't recommend it enough. I didn't know who any of the people in this episode were. I didn't know what was going on in the background, and it did not matter at all. There is a plot that involves basically an elaborate series of barters done in a limited time in order to get a crucial repair for the ship done, and a whole interesting plot about what it means to believe in gods. Uh, And if you think they walk among you, how that influences your behavior. It was good, y'all. And I am officially taking recommendations for other, again, random standalone episodes that I can watch to kind of get some of the vibes of a show. And also like extra points if it's some kind of great little libertarian takeaway. Um, I did this with the Darmok episode also of Star Trek to help me understand how that episode correctly predicted memes, like as a form of communication, and um, the Vincent Van Gogh episode in Doctor Who. So if you have other thoughts, I'm open to them. But uh, Treachery, Faith, and the Great River, you can buy it for like a dollar on Amazon and just watch it. And you should. Uh, my recommendation, Catherine, is to watch the finale of Breaking Bad. That was a great way to consume the show for me. Yeah, the uh, last two episodes, really. The last two, exactly. That's that's correct. Yeah. Um, the penultimate as well. And also don't watch, in case you think that it was so great the first time around that it's going to survive watching again. And this is probably before you were born. But Nick will remember it. Uh, the uh, the moonlighting episode where they uh, do yeah, Taming yeah, of yeah. the Shrew or some Shakespeare thing. Not yeah. good. Didn't, didn't hold up. There, there was also a whole subgenre of shows in the late 80s and early 90s where the characters would somehow be cast back into a USO show during World mm-hmm. War II. Oh, I, I like that. That's my, that's my <clears throat> jam. It's I want this. The only thing that would have been great is if MASH had done that or China Beach. Uh, so it's like you get into an even worse war. But China Beach, deep cut. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, well, been- Tom Sizemore, pour one out. Yeah. Pour out a big fat line of Coke and maybe heroin. P- Peter. Yeah, I, I watched <laughs> Star Tom Wars. Sizemore. Surprisingly. What a surprise. Yeah, so the, the first uh, episode of season three. So, the, so you have the nothing new. Well, that's kind of what I want to talk about. So it's Star Wars and it's fun if you like Star Wars, right? Um, it's kind of, it's, you know, a, a sort of Boba Fett-esque spinoff. It's not Boba, sorry, Boba Fett. I always want to say Baba and that's like, wow. a, and it just is, I'm going to get that right someday. Baba uh, right? So. Baba Fett, I think, is the guru that Pete Townsend so, followed for a while. That's right. But I think it's even more fun yeah. if you like modern Star Wars, because The Mandalorian, which was created by John Favreau, is really the product of the last 15 years or so of Star Wars stories overseen by Dave Filoni, who is a top level producer here and has written and directed episodes. And Filoni's stories have mostly come in cartoon form, uh, starting with the Clone Wars series, then Star Wars Rebels, currently The Bad Batch, which is a kind of great show about a group of clone troopers who rebel against the Empire, right? They, they're like, even though they're clones, they find their individuality, right? And, and the thing about Dave Filoni is he is a Star Wars super fan. And, and a good and smart one, but still a fan. And so this plays like sort of fan fiction in that his project is basically to rescue modern Star Wars, especially the prequels, from the stilted weirdness of George Lucas. And in the course of doing so, he's more or less built an entirely new Star Wars mythology with weird stuff like the Darksaber and the different clans of Mandalore, which like you don't need to really understand anything about. And yet this season is going to deliver us a whole history history of like the the infighting and clans of uh, amongst the clans of, of Mandalore and how the planet got like blown up and all of that stuff um and what it really amounts to is a wholesale gut job of the franchise while leaving the facade in place. And so if you walk around DC, you will see all of these row houses where like the front wall is the same, but they've literally in some cases not just taken out all of the interior down to the studs. They've also taken out the back wall of the roof and like there's no real house left. It's just the front wall, but it still sort of fits in. You're like, oh, it's that house. I've walked by this a million times. That's Star Wars today under Dave Filoni. He's just built a whole new mythological infrastructure out of what 
what George Lucas created. And in a lot of ways, that's to George Lucas's credit, because George Lucas has always said, well, look, you know, this is a this is in some sense a group project, even, you know, in the starting in the late 1980s or so, he allowed the expanded universe to come in to, you know, to be built out, at, uh, which has now been sort of uh, omitted from the canon. But he allowed the creation of a whole sort of universe of extra stories. He allowed fans to make uh, to make things like the great mockumentary mashup of cops and Star Wars troops, which was one of the first fan made um, uh, movies to sort of go viral on the Internet in the late 1990s. And George Lucas had always sort of had this lax attitude towards his work where, yeah, you know what, if you're going to profit off of it, then it needs to come through me. But I will let you tell uh, stories in this world. And if you're not going to profit off of it, you know, go bonkers, go bananas. I feel like that actually is just going to like make people even happier with it. It's going to make people love Star Wars more, the fact that they get to play around in this. And so Filoni, I think, combines those tendencies. He is a fan and treating this in many ways like a fan, although he's doing this, of course, under the official auspices of Lucasfilm. And it's just been fascinating to watch the evolution of the series, basically over the, the course of my entire life. Uh, and I think The Mandalorian, it's it's not... I don't know. It's not great, but it's really fun. It's expertly delivered. The effects work is actually better than a lot of movies that I've been seeing recently. Um, if you like Star Wars, if you like modern Star Wars, if you like Star Wars cartoons, The Mandalorian season three now on Disney Plus, it's pretty good. It's enjoyable. Is uh, Baby Yoda toilet train yet? I, I think he's still working on not eating the uh, the like infant fetuses of the um, the frog lady. It's hard for him. Uh, I also, before we get off Star Wars, and yeah, I, I realize that, you know, now. we haven't spent enough time on Star Wars, but um, a couple of years ago, I suggested that Jar Jar was a senator uh, in the Star Wars universe, and in fact, he wasn't. Yeah. He was merely a representative of you know, you wherever the fuck he's from. Yeah, of, of like a denim clad future in which the uh, survivors. Have Wait, is Jar Jar like, is he like, a, is an Eleanor Holmes Norton situation? I think he's like the Eleanor Holmes Norton. And that is so racist, Catherine. I don't even want to wow. uh, acknowledge oh. it again. But, I don't see. Uh, no, but it's actually, it I think it's Nick. Queen or pre Queen Amadula or, uh, you know, Amygdala <laughs> is the actual senator. Uh, uh yeah. all right. This is the section of the uh, podcast actually it's where Kevin Nick Kevin Kramer. Talking. Kevin Kramer is the senator from <laughs> Nauvoo. <laughs> this is the section of the podcast where Nick stops talking. <laughs> yeah, Nick stops talking. I'm the problem here. Uh yeah, you <laughs> good point. My uh my cultural recommendation uh is speaking of Boys Life 1969 and cartoons, <laughs> it's Apollo Ten and a Half. Yeah. Which is a cartoon about a boy's life in 1969. <laughs> Literally, a uh, boy. Uh, this is Richard Linklater. He does the same kind of animation that they did. In, he did in a Scanner Darkly. So it's a, he filmed a live action against a green screen and then did the weird thing on it afterwards. Rotoscoping. And, thank you for the word. Um, and uh, it was introduced to me by my eight-year-old daughter. She's like, hey, dad, I think you'll like this one. Uh, and uh, it was really kind of wonderful to watch her watch it with me because it is a, a anyone who uh, grew up in the 1970s to any degree um, will have at least some uh, affinity for it because it's largely it's a magical realist tale about a 10 year old kid who um, uh, who grows up in Houston and dad works for NASA because everyone's dad works for NASA and they're in a new suburb. Um, and the the magical part of the magical realism fable is that he uh, as the 10 year old has a secret mission that predates the the man uh, landing uh, on Mars because they built a spacecraft too small. I'm not giving it away. Uh, and they had to put a kid in it. But the the uh the realism part is the rest of the movie which is just basically this is what life was like as a kid growing up uh in it's 69 but it's very 70s like here's the serials here's the tv shows here's the kind of stuff that we would play here's the the back of the pickup truck that we would all sit on the edge of as we we're flying down the highway and no one cared um this is the station wagon i mean just so many things that are name checked um uh Anyone who I know who has seen it, who's roughly my age, uh, just lists off all the things that they've they've uh, uh, recognized and identify with. And then if you grew up as I did in a, in a very uh, aerospace kind of uh, region, it's just it's nuts how much it hits almost to the point where it's like it could be too much for people who are allergic to. Here's just all the way that culture 
was consumed um, back then. But it was an interesting way to transmit the, uh, uh, hey, eight-year-old, here's how my childhood was. And then she had the great idea, like, let's watch it with grandma and uh, grandpa. So we watched it with my mom and my stepdad uh, uh, the next night after watching it, which is really kind of a, a fun experience. Uh, really, really like it. Um, it. It's kind of it, it pairs well with a recent essay by Freddie DeBoer, and that's not a phrase that I use often in a recommendation uh, <laughs> uh, a thing where he talks about uh, uh, life in the 90s and how uh, it was different to be like a teenager in the 90s um, than it is now. And he's sort of like listing the almost banal types of ways, but it is really interesting how different the acquisition of culture was uh, from the 70s to the 90s to the aughts. And the final thing I'll add to this or whatever we're living through the 20s, the, the new roaring 20s. Um, I also had the the privilege of of watching this and thinking about these kind of different things with uh, my mom is writing it, working on her uh, memoir right now and talks about her uh, upbringing in the 1940s and uh, the way that they kind of acquired culture and, and dealt with stuff. Just really like a kind of a wonderful mashup to see all of this. And it's really hard to escape the conclusion that again, my eight-year-old has like, wow, it's just so much better now. (laughs) Isn't that great though? I mean, that's, that's a great message that should be shouted from the rooftop. It really is. It actually really is. Um, uh, even though she enjoyed uh, the movie and enjoyed, uh, uh, imagining what it'd be like to like watch twilight zone in 1972. Um, uh, she's very, uh, excited that she lives in as someone who All grew right, up in uh, the 1990s for for- in a government engineer culture, there were a lot of uh, uh, Air Force uh, uh, rocket scientists where I grew up, and uh, co- uh, there were contractors for the most part, but um, a lot of a lot of rocket scientists. And like I, there were there were some similarities, but I'll just say like you don't have to be exactly Matt's age to have enjoyed that movie. It's really. Yeah. Just delightful, and it's does it's like Word just nostalgic scientists? enough without being overly sentimental. Were rocket scientists in the nineties like was that a good time to be a rocket scientist, or was it kind of like, eh, we're not doing? I think it was a pretty good time to be a rocket scientist where I lived in Rocket Science Central. Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, Matt. Is Alex Jones? Does he have a cameo in this as he does in most Richard Linklater movies? Not that I'm aware. Slacker. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, the uh, the main narration voice, which I only saw in the uh, in the credits, was uh, Jack Black, and he's terrific. Um, just sort of has this really nice, mild kind of Austin or not Austin, but uh, Houston uh, drawl. It's, it's great. Um, all right, uh, we're running late. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you like our stuff in the Affinity subscription model. Um, go to reason.com slash donate um, or subscribe to the damn magazine. It's pretty good. It's cheap too. Go for it. Uh, and uh, also, if you like our podcast, go to reason.com slash podcast to get the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie and also the Soho Forum debate series with Dr. Gene Epstein. Uh, Nick, do you have any speakeasy uh, business coming up? I, well, I, can I just point out two things? One, I was an Eagle Scat, Matt. So I didn't read Boy's Life in 1969, but I was subscribing to it a decade later. And Gene Epstein only has a master's. He's not a doctor. He's not part of the professoriate or the doctorate. Class. Have you not seen the man dance? Uh, you Shaking know, my damn I head. I hope not. Uh, that is a Chinese plot, I think. But in any case, uh, we've got a great uh, version of our live stream with Vinay Prasad uh, coming up on Wednesday and on Monday, April 3rd in New York City. We're going to have the authors of The Individualists, John Tomasi and Matt Zwolinski, uh, doing a live interview uh, in Midtown Manhattan. Go to reason.com slash events, and you'll be able to get information about that later today. Awesome. All right. Thanks. See you next week.